I just got back from watching A Little Life at the Harold Pinter Theatre here in London's West End. And before I go any further, I want to give two disclaimers about this video. Number one is the, the book that it's based on by Hanya Yanagihara and the play itself too are full of very difficult, disturbing, harrowing themes and scenes. And I will be discussing those in this video, so you've been warned. And second, I have a lot of critique that I want to present regarding my opinion of what I saw today in the theatre. And I want to make it as clear as I can that I'm not singling any actor or any member of staff that worked on the production out here. I know that dozens of massively talented people worked tirelessly to bring this mammoth book to life. And despite some of the negatives that I'm going to be bringing up in this video, I still respect and admire their hard work work, even if the summation of that hard work, the piece of art that they've created, is something that I personally just didn't click with. I'm trying to be respectful here, but I also want to be honest as a critic in this case as to how I felt having just read the book. The story of A Little Life follows four friends who become friends in college and then essentially grow up together. And you follow the tracks that each of their lives take, primarily focused on Jude St. Francis, who has an extremely difficult childhood. The trauma of his past, which we'll get into a little later, haunts and follows him throughout the rest of his life, and his friends support him or don't in certain instances as that all transpires. But despite needing to cover a lifetime of characters in somebody's life, in multiple people's lives, you don't actually have that many people involved and on stage. You've got your main quartet, that main for Jude, Willem, Malcolm, and JB. And then you have Jude's doctor throughout his life, Andy. You've got Harold, who is professor to Jude at one point, and then later in life actually ends up adopting him. You have Anna, a counsellor who tried to help Jude when he was 16 to recover from some of the traumas of his childhood, but then died. And so she is a ghost throughout the entire production. And you have all of the people in Jude's life who abused or mistreated him in some way. And three of those people are pulled out and surfaced as the most important to the plot. And all three of them are played by Elliot Cohen. James Norton playing Jude does fine. I didn't particularly connect to his character, and we'll talk more about this, but I also didn't feel like he was especially lacking in any certain area. But I did really enjoy the performance of Zubin Vala. I think Zubin Vala just in general is phenomenal. I saw him in Tammy Faye at the Almeida and was blown away by him then, and didn't quite connect with him on that level in A Little Life, but certainly felt like he was earning his paycheck. He was doing very, very well. Whereas Almost all the other characters, in my opinion, just performed, but didn't necessarily grip me in the way that I was kind of hoping some of them might. There were also one or two moments, and I, I don't know how I feel about calling out specific acting performances here, but in those moments, I felt so detached from what was happening on stage because the acting felt so bad. And I know that's crazy to say, like, it's the Harold Pinter, it's a West End theatre, and I'm sitting here as, like, a non-trained actor in any capacity, being like, the acting is not good enough, Meh. But it was just a few moments with a certain character and the way that they were delivering their lines, and it just, it just didn't land for me. It didn't sell the emotion in any way, really, which I was really frustrated by because in the book, I thought that was such an important thing. Again, don't know how I feel about calling out what I'm exactly talking about here. I feel like that might seem a little bit too targeted. I don't know. So for now, I'm just going to be vague on that point. Let me know what you think I should do with that sort of thing in the future, though, in the comments. Now, having just read the book, I've got so much to say about the plot and what they chose to bring to stage and what they didn't, and just in general, how the story evolves. And so I want to more or less rapid fire run run through a lot of those insights as a bit of a checklist now. For starters, you might have noticed when I was rattling through who was present in the play that I didn't mention Julia, who is Harold's wife, Harold being the professor that adopts Jude. And Julia is one of the only quite important female characters in the book. There aren't that many others. And while Julia isn't 
particularly talkative in the book, necessarily. There are specific moments where her presence and maybe her kind of background chatter with Harold is actually vitally important to Jude feeling like he is in a family of sorts now. It's Julia's presence who at other times is what he's most enjoying, his dialogue with her or her actions. Like there is a real importance to that relationship, I think, it's completely gone in the play. I understand why. The play's already three hours and 40 minutes long. It's a real slog. There's just a lot of material there. And so another character being involved might have just been too much. But for me, it was a loss. There is also no Jackson. So in the book, JB ends up in a relationship with Jackson, who is massively manipulative and abusive towards him. This fuels JB's spiral into addiction, and it's a crucial moment in the book. It's not just another thing that happens, because it leads to Jude being mocked by JB physically and having his limp and the way he holds himself made fun of to such an extent that all of Jude's sort of internalized trauma and fear about how people see him is confirmed to him in that moment. What JB is doing is so abhorrent, but he feels so true that it leaves an irrevocable kind of mark on him almost. And because Jackson is only mentioned in voiceover or monologue in the performance, you kind of see JB spiral and fall apart very quickly, actually in the space of about two or maybe three minutes. And it doesn't feel like there's build up to this. It just happens. And that is something I really strongly disliked. I think it was performed perfectly fine. Amari Douglas does a great job with what he's been given, but I just really dislike the pacing in this moment. And alongside issues with JB's character, I also really thoroughly dislike how they've done Malcolm in the play. Malcolm in the book is an architect and he's described as being the first person to see that Jude was disabled, not in a condescending way, not in a judgmental way, but rather kind of getting it that Jude would need that support and that help throughout his life to get over his disabilities, especially as they become more pronounced as he gets older. And so there's an insightfulness to Malcolm's character, but there's also a somewhat reservedness. He doesn't really know how to insert himself in certain situations. And he himself is really struggling to figure his own life out as the book progresses. And in the play, that didn't really come across. Instead, in the play, he's much more goofy, like at times almost to the point of feeling like he was trying to be comedic relief. But that never felt like the Malcolm that we got to know in the books, or at least in my opinion. That wasn't what he was there to do from a narrative construction point of view or from just a tone point of view. Anna, who I mentioned was that psychologist that tried to help Jude when he was younger, is also much more present. And this one's interesting because Jude wishes throughout the book that Anna had been able to help him open up to people so that he could share some of those demons that he has trapped inside him. And that is present throughout, don't get me wrong, but it's more him wishing of her than her directly being his subconscious or being someone that he's pleading with in a given moment. And so to see that visualized was quite interesting, actually. I think I liked it. I think that it added some flavor in certain moments where in the book, he is just pleading to a voice in italics in his head, but the play gives a character to that voice and it's Anna's voice. And I thought that that was an interesting touch and something that maybe I could have intuited from the book, but I think you could also choose or just happen to not intuit from the book and that the play removes the choice from and just says, this is what's happening here. And I like the change. There's also a huge amount of visual scenes that are omitted in favor of just a few words being spoken to tell you what has happened or what will happen. So for example, at one point, Jude is supposed to be beginning to be pestered by some people in his life, in his 40s, I believe, to get into a relationship because he's never been in one as far as they've known. And they think he might be lonely. And he is lonely. And when the people around him start saying it, he kind of bends to the pressure. He meets this guy called Caleb. Caleb is very manipulative and Jude very naive. And that's obviously a recipe for disaster. And their relationship ends up being abusive. And Caleb is also horrible towards Jude. 
and his disabilities, saying that his wheelchair detests him, he isn't allowed to use his wheelchair around Jude, things like that. And so in the book, when Caleb is initially presented, I think the viewer has a little hope that maybe this will be something that will bring some happiness to Jude, but you very soon find out that Caleb is absolutely awful. And there's this just seriously messed up, harrowing, horrible scene in the book in which Jude basically bumps into Caleb while he's getting dinner with Harold and Caleb is drunk and says all these horrible things about Jude's disabilities and Harold very nearly gets in a fight with him but Caleb leaves and then when Jude gets home that night Caleb is in his house waiting for him and Jude is sexually assaulted in a variety of different ways it's really gruesome and eventually the assault and just the level of abuse reaches such a fever pitch that Jude is kicked down the stairs. And this is a crescendo in the book. It's a massive deal. And you're reading it mournful of the fact that throughout Jude's life, again and again and again, he's had so many horrible things happen to him. And you yourself start to lose faith in humanity a bit because you're seeing just how relentless life can be in stepping on someone and holding them down. And in the play, there is no kick. It just goes to voiceover. I believe Anna says what happened there. And I get it. Like, that's a hard thing to stage. But for me, it meant that if I didn't know what happened in the book, I think I would have lost something that I think is really vital about the way that that scene takes place. Because he, in the book, obviously lands at the bottom of the stairs and crashes sideways into the wall. And it's very reminiscent. In fact, symbolically, it's almost a mirror image of what Jude has himself done when he's been trying to avoid to self-harm in the past. He's cut previously, but there are points in his life where he doesn't do that and he instead slams himself into the wall over and over again to elicit this feeling of pain and release. And I think that there's some really important connection in Caleb's act of removing the choice from the situation and booting him down the stairs and forcing him to slam into the wall in this way. And the way those two things rhyme is gone in the play, which I think is really unfortunate. And it also leads to another issue, which is that during all of this, there is supposed to be this whole kind of mental moment where he's flying down the stairs and he pauses and his brain has time to think. And this is something you can do in a book, but you can't really do very easily in a play. Maybe you find a way to do it, but it's certainly harder than just having a paragraph of exposition and then resuming the action where it left off. In the book, there's this whole discussion of mathematics in this moment. You've got this axiom of equality where X equals X and it's this idea that if you do declare something to be something, then that is what it is. There is no denying its existence as what you have named it to be. And Jude in this moment is suffering to such an extent that all of his fears internally have been realized that he is indeed this worthless human being that is only good for all of these horrible acts that are being perpetrated and committed to him. And that is all Jude St. Francis is and will ever amount to. And so in that moment, it's this assertion, X is X, he is vile, he should be detested, etc. But in the play, you just don't really get that because... He's trying to kind of get through this math while all of this stuff is happening. And for someone that doesn't know the book, doesn't know the source material, it's like, okay, he's talking about maths while he's being beaten up and he's being abused and like all of these things. And it, it just feels chaotic and cluttered in a way that I personally didn't like at all. And this lack of the play being a book sounds like an insane critique to have, but it really hurts the play like to an incredibly large degree. Because in the book, Jude's internal dialogue can tell you that he hates being touched. He's terrified of being touched. He never lets anyone see his back. He never lets anyone see his arms, etc. because he's got loads of scarring and he cuts. And in the play, you're reliant on this either being just told to you in exposition via a monologue, which it isn't really, or being made extremely obvious by the performance. But there are so many of these moments in the book that they couldn't possibly all be performed in one sitting. And so the amount of contact, human contact that Jude has in the play, to me, was one of those things that felt unrealistic to Jude's character. It doesn't feel to me like Jude is someone that would ever really be touched by anyone around him. And he has 
huge amounts of trouble with just being given a hug in the book. And yet in the play that happens multiple times and we kind of miss the fact that he's so wounded in that regard. Jude's lawyeriness is also pretty much completely omitted from the play. And in the book, his lawyer job that he does alongside all of his suffering is super important because it allows him to buy the life that he needs to support it, which is mentioned basically in one scene in the play. But in the book, it's in that scene and then it's in pretty much every other moment thereafter. Jude's massive stacks of cash that he spends on this fancy house and helping build that house with Willem is super important because it's the one place where Jude feels feels normal. Everywhere else, he doesn't. At Rosen and Pritchard, he, he's just numbers, as he says in the only scene that mentions this in the play, and that's also obviously in the book. But we don't get a chance to sit with that, because the play just keeps bouncing forwards. It's got so much material to chew through, and that means that you don't really get to appreciate what that means for him. It just happens, and then you move on. And that applies to Jude's willingness, or rather lack of willingness, to be helped as well. In the book, it's super frustrating at times because the people around Jude all do want to help him in theory, but they're not very good at it. And Jude is therefore always able to get out of it until he's literally at death's door. And in the play, he just sort of gets to death's door pretty much instantly. You don't really see the buildup of the suffering or the buildup of the deterioration of his body. And so you don't see enough, I don't think, of the refusal that he goes through over and over again to be helped. And I think that's a really vital part of his character because it's such a truth of the world that people that might struggle with something are often most protective of that thing that they are struggling with. They have these complexes that they will have built up about them. And so as much as someone else's input or assistance may be helpful to solving that problem, it's a misunderstanding of the situation to think that that's what they want. They don't want the problem solved for them. They need to overcome it themselves. And you don't really see that in the play. And it's so important in the book. The same applies for his cutting, which is actually very graphically shown in the play and which I think I appreciated the first time it happened. But then the second time, I wasn't sure if it maybe should have been done in a different way. It just felt like we now knew what that was and we'd almost acclimatized to it. The third time is when he tries to end his life and this moment in the play is really shocking. People definitely found this very difficult in the audience and I just kind of thought it was okay but didn't really feel this massive sense of sadness for Jude in that moment and also didn't get the appreciation that the book gives you of how meticulously he plans that moment and the the book also gives you much more information about why he survives it and also gives you a little bit more flavor as to just how far he tried to go. There's detail about how much he cuts there to try and end his life that isn't in the play and I think that's fair enough but it's important I think that detail and you knowing why he's able to survive all of these gruesome things over and over again is also important and so having a little bit of context as to the fact that somebody did find him I think would have been nice. It's just that the person that found found him was removed from the play. Another thing removed is the dialogue that he has internal to himself. And again, this is because it's not a book, so it's one of those sorts of flaws. When he ends up in a relationship with Willem and he's trying to figure out how to keep Willem in the relationship while juggling the fact that Jude has been through so much sexual abuse and absolutely hates that. He doesn't want any of that in his life, but he wants Willem to stay. And so he sort of permits Willem to do that with him, except he lies to Willem and just tells him that he enthusiastically does want it and that he is enjoying it. And the way that this all goes down in the book is so sad. It's so awful because you sort of see his conundrum and you can base your understanding of why he feels like he's incapable of saying no to it on all of his past experiences. Like you can kind of sort of understand in the book that he feels like he doesn't deserve happiness. And so of course there has to be some aspect of difficulty or this horrible feeling that he has to persevere through in order to continue having a potentially happy life with Willem. But in the play, it's not really there. And I think that gives you less of an understanding of Willem's character as well. Willem is in the book 
absolutely not just a pure and good guy. He says there are multiple points in the book, in fact, where he says that he sort of knows that Jude isn't into this, but he doesn't want to admit to himself that Jude is lying. And Jude continues to lie and he continues to go along with it. And then at one point where it's just too much for him, he asks Jude if this is still okay. And Jude lies and he knows he's lying, but he keeps going. And this is damning of Willem's character. It's gone in the play. In the play, you're just like, oh. He's just cute with him. No! Like, there are massive flaws here. I'm not saying that their relationship doesn't improve later, etc. But I think that that is a massive aspect of you feeling as a reader of the book, like even the best person in the world for Jude, Willem, who would never hurt him, etc., is hurting him by virtue of the flaws in his own personality that don't allow him to more athletically tackle all of the obstacles in his way in getting to the core of Jude's personality and his problems. He's also completely cowardly in many moments in favor of his own temporary comfort and sort of Jude's fake level of comfort. Like, it's because of the sex that Jude ends up cutting to the extent that he does while he's initially with Willem in that period. And Willem is still aware of that, and it still happens. Like, that's meant to be messed up, but that kind of blame almost is gone in the play. It's just Jude's messed up, so he's cutting. There's maybe one more scene that I want to specifically call out here, which is when Jude burns his arm. And I was so intrigued as to how they were going to pull this off. And I think that the set and the way that they constructed things was very smart in this regard because he does seem to literally set his arm on fire. But the problem is it's a play and so he's got to talk through some dialogue about what he's thinking about while his arm is on fire and you, the viewer, just stop believing it so quickly. Whereas in the book, he sets it alight and then instantly you can pause time and you can get through paragraphs and paragraphs of internal monologue before you snap back to the moment and he smells that kind of sooty blackened charred smell and he realizes oh my god it's my arm and then extinguishes it and goes to hospital etc in the play you just sort of watch him burn for like a minute and a half and then he's like oh it's too much no man didn't land for me at all personally hated this. I would have much rather they try to do it as him lighting the oil on his arm, being in agony for a moment, extinguishing it, maybe passing out, and then while passed out, that's when you do the little exposition dump. So that choice to deploy that bit of dialogue while burning there was something I didn't really like. I didn't also enjoy some of the intonation of some of the lines. So in the book, for example, there's this awful line that stuck with me so clearly where Jude's internal dialogue says, not having sex. It was one of the best things about being an adult. Like, how messed up is that? But in the play, he delivers the line almost like a goofy one-liner. He's like, not having sex is one of the best things about being an adult. And as an audience member, I was there going, man, that line in the book was like burned into the page for me. And he's just dropping it like it means nothing here and saying it with so much kind of jollity. Like, come on, it just it didn't work at all for me. I appreciate that throughout the entire play, so much of it is true to script from the book. So much of Hanya Yanagihara's metaphor and specific lines that she would have written are all lifted directly from book to play. But there's a level of care that needs to happen with that. And I think in one or two areas, they missed that. The set is designed quite interestingly. You've got a kitchen, and a bathroom and an operating table and a couch and sofa and an artist studio with a load of paintings and an architecture design office all present on set all at once. And you also on the side have a video of New York, which is projected onto one wall. And I thought the set was fine. They made good use of it. And some of the things that I weren't sure how they were going to deal with, like a few scenes where there's a car present, were handled with grace enough in that space. But there's one choice, which is to have a massive black box descend in the final moments of the play when Jude is in his wheelchair. And while that's happening, his life is being talked about by Anna and also by Harold. And when the box lifts back up into the sky and your vision of where Jude previously was is returned, you see that his wheelchair is empty and Harold is just left kind of pleading to the chair. I thought this was very weird. I haven't seen something like this before. 
I don't know if this is meant to look as industrial as it did. Like there is sort of scaffold on the box. It's not a very aesthetically pleasing box and it's pretty massive as well. And as far as I could tell, nothing else changed other than once it had raised back up, he was no longer there, i.e. he was in the box. But I just, I just don't understand, like, why was it presented with that specific visual? Couldn't they have made it look different in some way? I don't, I don't know. This, as a design choice, baffled me, to be honest. The last stage-related thing I'll say is that there's also an audience in set area. So you've got your normal audience seating, but then on the other side of the stage, you have a small audience section. So it's kind of an attempt maybe at being in the round, except it's not really. And this is interesting. It didn't really affect my viewing of it particularly, but it does play into some of my thinking about how I've processed the play since I've seen it. And I was reading a bunch of other people's reviews just to see what other critics were saying. And I read one that I really enjoyed by Jason Okandaye, which I actually want to discuss in a little detail now, because one of the things that Jason has a problem with is the fact that the play kind of feels like they're saying, come and see the mangled and wounded man and watch how much he can endure until he finally throws in the towel. Like it's this trauma spectacle and that's almost all it amasses to at the end of the play. And I wonder, I want to contextualize this in the context of the audience seating, whether there was an attempt from the director, Ivo Van Hove, of making the audience reflect on the fact that we are looking in and we're seeing ourselves kind of enraptured by this spectacle in front of us, but none of us are doing anything. And similarly, in Jude's life, there are so many moments where awful things are happening. And while his friends make sometimes token moves to try and help him or do make serious moves and serious sacrifices to try and help, they always stop short and end up just continuing to watch the world burn in some ways. And it's a big frustration of the book. It's like, how do you help someone that doesn't want to be helped is a real core theme. But I, I just wonder, I don't know, I haven't thought about this in great depth, but I don't know if maybe the director there is trying to prompt a thought in us that we too are somewhat complicit in that because all we're doing in this situation is coming and just watching this wounded man get more and more wounded and mangled. Like, is the lens meant to be turning on us there a little bit because he's making the audience visible to the audience at all times in the production? Not sure. Let me know if you think I'm completely off base with that one. And Jason also says, with no moral lessons that I could discern, no Greek catharsis and very little aesthetic pleasure for its own sake, I had to wonder why anyone would bring this novel to the stage. There are some obvious reasons for this, which Jason is well aware of, obviously, like money. It was a very successful book and still is, and so bringing it to stage would make sense because of commercial reasons. But I think also the book, at least for me personally, did elicit a feeling of gratitude to the people that I have in my life and of empathy in a massive way for the suffering of those around me and also recognition of how short our time on this planet is. And although that isn't necessarily directly the result of the book, like the book, the book just does not have a cathartic ending. It's a really horrible ending, I think, in many ways. I think that you could imagine a world where you would want to bring it to the stage so that you could try and bring some of that out and present that to an audience. Some of that empathy that they feel at the end and some of that awe at the capacity of human suffering, but also maybe some of those really bright moments in the book where Jude really does experience this massive amount of happiness. Maybe that could have been surfaced more. It's just that it wasn't. So I think that there's maybe motivation there. I just don't think it was successful. Overall, I regretfully have to say I really didn't like this production of A Little Life, despite absolutely loving the book and having been massively moved by it. I wasn't really moved by the theatre production today. It was certainly grotesque. I was certainly disturbed by it, but it didn't feel like the imagery that I was being presented with that was so disturbing had really any meaning at all, which I think is part of Jason's critique there. And I just struggled throughout with the fact that time and time again, things that I felt like in the book 
were extremely important to a character's arc or to understanding what the book was getting at when it was trying to show us that happiness or that empathy or that strength or whatever was then lost in the play. And instead you get this train that will not stop. It goes at a million miles an hour through so many different scenes trying to pack in so much and therefore doesn't allow you to really sit with the characters, grow with them in a way that feels satisfying, and empathize with them when they're at their best and at their worst. I think this is the most disappointed I've been with a theatrical production of anything in uh, as far as I can remember, maybe? And I want to leave you with one final little anecdote, which will maybe cheer you up a little bit and give you a reason for having watched this far into the video. So I had a standing ticket, and the person next to me was the worst theater goer I've ever stood next to at a theater because midway through act one, Willem and Jude were having a good time together and she audibly said while Willem was talking, this girl next to me standing at the top of the Harry Pinter said, he's gonna die. Girl, what are you doing? Can you not? Like, I'm trying to enjoy the play here. I'm glad I read the book, but otherwise I'd be so mad right now. I already was mad just for the fact that she was talking over the character. But then later, Jude ends up having an operation for his legs, right? He ends up basically getting prosthetic legs up to about his calf. And while he's talking on the operating table, girl next to me says he's going to kill himself. Why? Why can't you just be quiet? I hadn't said anything up to that point because I was just like, that's her business. Maybe she just needs to make some noise. She was like talking throughout the entire show to no one, by the way. She wasn't with anyone. But she says this. I look at her and say like, can you not do that, please? She stops for maybe 20 minutes and then just starts again, all over again. Like she'd be at a pace of like three scenes in advance. She would say what was about to happen in three scenes time. I don't understand it, man. So I hope you've enjoyed this review. And I hope me voicing some anger about this experience has given you a bit of catharsis as to your theater frustrations too, because I'm sure we've all had them. They all suck. And I'm sure they're all going to keep happening as well. <laughs>